Okay, it, yeah. okay, today we're talking about chapter 4, section 3, the area and definite integrals. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna teach this a little bit different than, than how the textbook would go about it, mainly because uh, the, um, uh, the, the build-up has... Is uh, all right. To me, it's a little, it's a little unnecessary, especially considering last section. So everything, everything I'm, I'm about to skip is, is um, honestly, we're gonna do it in, in, in example four. It's just we're gonna know what we're doing it, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. Go ahead and skip or snip that. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and jump straight to this theorem as well because this theorem is um, well, it's 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 the main part of integral calculus. This is uh, the fundamental theorem of it. So start at the top uh, in 4.1 and 4.2, we consider examples in which we showed a relationship between the area under the graph of a function f and the function's antiderivative, capital F. So keep that in mind, the antiderivative is the capital F. In this section, we show that this relationship is true for any continuous function over a closed interval. This result is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus. So real quickly, let's, uh, again, we don't necessarily need, need this, but, but uh, the, the top definition leads into the fundamental theorem. So let f be any continuous function over, and again, this, uh, recall that this notation is just an interval uh, from a to b. Doesn't matter what a is, doesn't matter what b is, it's just an interval from there, uh, a to b. And f, capital F, be the antiderivative of lowercase f. Then the definite integral of lowercase f from a to b is, and the notation is written like this. So uh, again, we just have some, some function, it right? doesn't matter what some function, right? But we put the numbers. We we, we put the um, the well. If if you think of a b as a number line or, or on a number line rather, a is a smaller number, uh, the number that's farthest to the left on the number line, and b would be the number that's farthest to the right. So the notation is written with an a down here on the lower part of the integral sign, and then the b is written up here to the top part. That basically tells you where your interval is located. All right, so. Uh, if I were to take the integral of some function from a to b, then that uh, the well the area from a to b is going to be capital F, so it's going to be the antiderivative of b minus the antiderivative of a. All right, and more uh, precisely, the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you recall, in the last section, we did we did. Um, um, what are we? we summed a bunch of rectangles and we spoke about how you know the more rectangles we have the more precise that we have uh, the more precise of an area under that curve we have and I mentioned you know it's uh, th th that particular method you know it's it's nice to know it's nice to know that where where the the idea of finding the area under a curve came from but it was long it was tedious and it was not precise at all unless you had a lot of rectangles uh, an infinite amount to be exact. All right, that's what we did in the last section. Well, we can sum all that up and be precise and have a simpler solution by just doing uh, this definite integral. So we see that the sum of all the rectangles is just going to be equal to what we have up here, the definite integral. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at an example. And again, like I said, the, the first two examples basically lead up to that. It just doesn't say it exactly. All right. However, we're going to say it exactly now going into example four. And like I said, I, uh, the, the, the way the textbook goes about doing things sometimes, I don't know. At the same time, though, this, this is an applied course and not a, um, a rigorous mathematical course. So maybe that's another reason why. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and snip uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, and put it above this example so we can follow along with it. Right, and again, this is, if you recall, this is how I concluded the last section. I just kind of gave you a little sneak peek as again to me, this is the main part, and but we just drug out the introduction for so long. Right. So example four, it wants us to evaluate each of the following. So we're going to evaluate uh, A, uh, we're going to look at the integral 
from negative 1 to 4, that's the interval, and we're going to uh, take the antiderivative of x squared minus x, and we're going to turn it into, uh, we're going to do capital F of b, so the antiderivative of our function here, and we're going to plug in 4, and then subtract the antiderivative of this, uh, and, um, and plug in a negative 1. We're going to do it for all of these. So let's begin. Uh, we're definitely not going to be able to fit all this on a page. So uh, let's go ahead and take the antiderivative here. And the antiderivative um, is going to be, so what is the uh, antiderivative of x squared? That's just going to be x cubed over, oh, by the way, the notation is super important. So the way you do this is uh, you basically put it in bracket. It doesn't necessarily show it here. Let me see. Um, I guess it doesn't. Okay, uh, it does kind of, never mind, okay, so it does kind of show it there. So let's, let's snip this and put it on this page. Okay, and the notation is pretty important because it, it helps, it, it helps uh, keep, your, keep your ducks in a row here. And uh, the part that I'm focusing on here is that when we take the antiderivative of our function, uh, we, we are obviously dropping our integral sign here, right? Um, but we still need to know where the interval is. Well, we, you put the interval on the outside of the bracket there. So uh, that would be the notation that we're going to be using here. So again, uh, the antiderivative of x squared, we, we, can, we can integrate these uh, separately. Okay, so the antiderivative of x squared is just going to be x cubed over 3. And then minus, well, the antiderivative of uh, x is just going to be x squared, so x, well, x squared over 2, rather. And then my interval is from 4 to negative 1. Okay. So again, that's the notation we're going to use. Uh, I just did the first step. All I did here was I just uh, took the antiderivative of my function, and I took my, um, my interval from negative 1 to 4, and I put it here on the outside. So the way we go about doing this, and I'm probably going to do this for every single problem, uh, or not, I mean, I will, but um, every single problem is going to have to take up an entire page, is what I meant to say. So the way we do this is we're just going to um, take this, this function and plug in those values for a negative 1 and subtract the capital F of negative 1. So we're going to say, let's see if I can find a way to, hmm. all right, let's, Let's actually erase these and change it to a different color so we can see where we're where we're getting them and what we're doing. Okay. Alrighty, so we're gonna have four cubed over three minus four squared all over two and that is the first part. That is capital F, right? Again, capital F being the, the antiderivative. Um, so we're taking the, the antiderivative here and we're uh, evaluating at four. And then we're going to subtract the antiderivatives of uh, one, uh, evaluating at negative one rather. So we're gonna have uh, negative one Oh, that's the best small three I've ever made in this, uh, on this tablet. Uh, so, uh, and then minus negative one squared all over two. Okay. All right. And I probably should have written that a little smaller, but that's just the way it is. And so we're going to do the arithmetic uh, behind this. So, um, this is going to be 60, let's just go ahead and change color so we can differentiate here. We're going to have, this is going to be 64 over 3 minus, <coughs> excuse me, 16 over 2. So when, uh, 16 over 2 is 8, so we can just put minus 8 here. Okay, that takes care of this part. And we're going to say, um, well, let's we'll put parentheses, minus, and then this, 1 negative 1 cubed, that's going to be a negative 1 third. So negative 1 third. Move this toolbar out of the way. OK. 
okay. uh, negative one third, and then minus um, well negative one uh, squared is going to be one half, so one half. Alrighty, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop the parentheses uh, for this and do the arithmetic, so I can try to keep this all on one page, so we can you know the first parentheses. No big deal. Um, I distribute this negative sign through, so they both become positive. So I'm going to drop the parentheses and make them both positive. Plus, plus, and put this into the calculator. We've got 64 over 3 divided, or minus 8 plus 1 third plus 1 half. We end up with 14.17. So 14.17. And well, that was it. All right, uh, that was uh, well. I'll say that was that. That is basically the the whole idea of the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, fundamental theorem of integral calculus. So let's go ahead and snip this and go to B. Okay, let's see if I can write this a little smaller this time. Okay, so to write that as A. Okay, good. All right, so B. Right. Well, actually, okay. This 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 is a lot easier, actually. Okay, so um, we know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and so the antiderivative of e to the x is also e to the x. So I can write this simply as e to the x, and then I'm gonna put this in um, the the notation. I haven't put the brackets here. I'm gonna say from zero to two. So all we have to do is figure out. Uh, e squared minus e to, to the zeroth power. So we're going to say e squared minus e to the zeroth power. Okay. Well, e squared we know is uh, what do we do we actually know that? Uh, no, actually I don't think we do actually. Um, but e squared is uh, 7.389 and then minus one, right? Because uh, e in anything to the zeroth power is one. So I end up with a six point uh, 389 389 hmm. so that was pretty easy right. and next up we have 1 over X so again these are just I guess um, nice little refreshers on on uh, your 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 simple antiderivatives okay so what is the so we know that uh, the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, so therefore the antiderivative of 1 over x is going to be the natural log of x. So C, uh, what is, oh yeah, natural log of x. So we're going to say the natural log of x from 2 to 5. So we'll just write this as the natural log of 5 minus the natural log of 2. And what is the natural log of 5 minus the natural log of 2? And we get uh, 0 0.916. Okay. And the last example for, or the last one for this example rather, is going to be. One over x. So, uh, what is the antiderivative of one over x? Well, we know that it's going to be the uh, natural log of the absolute value of x. So that's going to be natural log of the absolute value of x, and that's from negative four to negative one. And so, taking the, the absolute value of these uh, values, rather, is just going to be the natural log of one, well, no, we'll do it this way. Absolute value negative one. Let's do that differently. There we go. 
uh, minus the natural log of negative 4, the absolute value of it. So again, that's just going to be the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of positive 4. So it's going to be, well, we know a natural log of 1 is, is 0, so it's just going to be a negative natural log of 4. So negative 1, point three eight six all right so that was uh computation heavy i guess uh well I, it wasn't too computation heavy rather uh after example uh 4a but that that is just basically the the fundamental theorem of integral calculus so you just you just basically integrate your function and then you evaluate your function at your uh boundaries now uh, your boundaries on an interval All right, so uh, what what exactly is the this um, definite integral? Well, the the definite integral is just basically the area under a curve. And again, we, we did that in the last section when we got the area under a curve with with our rectangles, and we spoke about how that is just so tedious and imprecise. However, this is precise. So let's go ahead and we'll snip this function here. All right, so looking at the text up here, when we evaluate the definite integral of a non-negative function f over the interval from a to b, we get the area under the graph of f. Or, or the, uh, I'm sorry, we get the area under the graph of f over that interval. So one over x squared. Uh, the function one over x squared uh, set like this. One second. No, I'm sorry. I, I knew better. All right, so my function one over x squared looks something like this. Okay, and. Uh, remember all those times in in your previous courses where you had to find the domain of a function? Uh, well, this is um, basically the domain. The domain being our interval. So looking at this particular example, we're wanting to look at just the area between, just the area between right here, 1 and 10. Just the area between 1 and 10. And we see that uh, better represented uh, in the picture here. So we're trying to find just the area under the curve between 1 and 10. So how do we do that? Well, we do it the exact same way we done, uh, we did rather the the examples in the previous examples. And yeah, so the way I'm going to write this, I'm going to write. Uh, so one, we're wanting to find the area under the graph of y is equal to 1 over x squared uh, over the interval from 1 to 10. So if I were to write this in a precise manner, I would write simply the integral symbol like this. Uh, we are going to put a 1 down here, a 10 up here. And then my function is um, 1 over x squared. So we could we can write this 1 over x squared dx. All right, so real quickly, before we, we get too far, this dx that we put here, uh, that basically tells us that we are integrating a the derivative of, of, of some function. That some function is the function that we're going to find. Now, uh, it, it is important to put, uh, especially because, and we're not actually going to do that in this course, but whenever you do something called integration by parts, and I think it's uh, chapter 4, section 6, you use that dx because, it, it, again, it's, it's the, the notation is precise, and in order to integrate, you have to take the derivatives of, of different uh, parts of your function whenever you integrate by parts. Uh, I hesitate to say that, you know, in this course, you can get away with not putting that there, but if you want to be more precise with the notation, uh, you really should, especially um, because you never know, you never know where, where your career might lead you, and you might actually go down a career in, in mathematics. And so, oh, that, that's, that's my moment, I guess. Uh, anyways, so how do we uh, uh, different or integrate this? Well, let's go ahead and uh, rewrite this now instead of um, 1 over x squared. Well, that's just the same thing as saying 
x to the negative 2. Right? And of course, that makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier to integrate because, well, we take the, the negative 2, we go up 1, uh, we, or rather we add 1. So we end up with, uh, where should I write? So we end up with uh, x to the negative 1 over uh, 1. Okay, and um, from here we can change, we can equate that. Let's put our notation here better. Uh, from 1 to 10. Right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but I don't really like dealing with negative exponents. So we can instead change this to a uh, 1 over x and then the negative out front. Right? All I did was, was take this negative exponent, put it down there in the bottom, and it becomes 1 over x, and of course this negative 1, the negative sign, goes out in front. Right, from 1 to 10, and that's going to be equal to, oh, this is pretty easy actually, um, it's going to just be equal to negative 1 over 10, um, minus uh, minus a negative, we'll just go ahead and put that like this, um, 1 over 1, which is just 1. Okay. So we're going to have a negative 1 tenth plus 1, which is going to just be equal to 9 tenths. Okay. So the area under this curve is just simply um, 9 tenths, or 0 0.9. So what, it, what does the area under the curve represent? Well, it, 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 it is just the area under a curve. So, um, however, let's get to go into some examples here, uh, some real-world examples, some applied examples. Okay, oh, that's pretty simple. All righty, uh, so... This problem, suppose that y is profit in dollars per mile traveled, and x is the number of miles traveled. Okay, So y, again, is just the name of the function. It's going to be the profit in dollars, and x is just going to be the number of miles traveled in thousands. So we have our function y is equal to 1 over x. Find the area under y is equal to 1 over x over the interval from 1 to 4 and explain what this area represents. Okay, So uh, a moment ago, I well, that was the first thing I drew right here, uh, 1 over x looks like this okay and we're wanting to find the 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 area under the curve from one to four so so it kind of looks like it kind of looks like uh the, the previous example that we did just do uh, at least the right side of it let's go and snip it okay all right so the first thing we're gonna do let's go ahead and and do the integration here and then we'll explain what it means. Okay, so uh, we've got the integral, the integral of uh, one over x dx uh, from one to four. All right. Well, the integral here is just going to be equal to uh, the natural log of x from 1 to 4, and so we're going to have the natural log of 4 minus the natural log of 1, and that's just going to be equal to one point three eight six. Did I just do this? One second, that number sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, there it is. Although it's an, it's the negative form of it. Okay. Alrighty, so uh, the area under our curve here, the area under uh, the 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 graph of one over x uh, from one to four is one point three eight six. Okay, so so what does that one point three eight six represent? That's uh, to explain what this area represents. Alrighty, so uh, if we are traveling in um, 
where x is the number of miles traveled by thousands. So the area of, um, hmm. oh yeah, it's profit, I'm sorry. Uh, I was wondering. So from one to four, we see that we have a profit of, um, doesn't really say, oh, it's uh, 1,386 dollars. Okay, so where do I get 1,386? Well, again, uh, x is in thousands, or uh, x is, is a number of miles traveled in thousands. So, uh, obviously, if I just take this and, you know, 1.386 and multiply it by 1,000, we'd get $1,300. Uh, so, what that area under there represents is just that we have a profit of uh, $1,300, or close to $1,400, uh, when we travel from 1,000 to 4,000 miles. Alrighty, so um, this uh, here, hmm, we'll, we'll, we'll snip it, we'll put it in the notes, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it briefly, mainly because, again, it's just one of those, the, the concepts that, that, that the textbook really likes to drag out. And, There's nothing wrong with that concept. It's just that since this is more of an applied course, it's not, I don't know, I hesitate to say it, so I'm not going to, I guess. Um, yeah, do that. And then our figures over here. Shoot. Okay, on second thought, let's just discuss it in the video and not snip it because I want it to look pretty, but I can't put those graphs over there. Alrighty, so. What is, what is this thing? Well, if we were to look at the, uh, we, we know the x squared, I'm not leave the pointer. We know the x squared is a, is a parabola, right? And the negative x squared is a parabola opening downward, right? Well, if I were to integrate the, um, the function x squared from zero to two, well, if, uh, it's gonna be a positive eight third if it's above the x axis it's going to be a negative 8 third if it's below the x-axis. And that's realistically what, what this is all saying, is whenever we talk about the area under a curve, uh, whenever we talk about the area underneath the, the x-axis, we, co we consider that a negative area. And now uh, it's a negative area, but it makes sense, and we'll see how it makes sense when we get to the uh, next two examples here. Uh, we, we, we can see the combined area under our said curve. So if we were to have the x squared minus 1, right? again, this is x squared minus 1. This is just a parabola, again, and the minus 1 tells us what we're, that we uh, shift down one unit. Well, the process here that the textbook is going over is integrating integrating from the, that function from 0 to 1. And again, 0 to 1 is just basically from uh, the origin all the way to right here, and so it's all the negative area, and then it's integrating from one to two, which is all the positive area. So what this textbook is showing is is that uh, if we take the the area that this negative area, right, and then added it to the uh, positive area, and then we end up with an area of two thirds. Well, conveniently, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do it the long way, and you can just simply say that well. Instead of going from 0 to 1 and then 1 to 2, you could indeed just go from 0 to 2 for this function, and then that negative area is taken care of. So, well, that's it. I know that's pretty hand-wavy, uh, but I also know that as, as students, some things are just, uh, some things are just, and, and I suffer from this, there, there are ways to say something too much, and I, th I think that is just one of those, one of those cases. I don't think we need to put it on a new page. Okay, so this this problem isn't much of a computation problem, but just kind of a you know what 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 kind of idea that can can you derive from this function?
Alrighty, so this problem reads, consider our function, um, predict the sign of the results by examining the graph shown to the right and then evaluate the integral. Okay, so looking at looking at this graph, right, it appears that we have more of the negative area than we do the positive area. So so the prediction, you know, pretty simple here is just that, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that when I evaluate this integral here, I'm going to end up with a negative number. Okay. Again, that's only because, like I said, the 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 pink shaded area. Well, it looks like th there's more of it than the gray shaded area. So let's go ahead and, and integrate this. So uh, negative x negative uh, yeah negative x cubed is going to be a negative x to the fourth over four, and then plus we got three x squared over 2 and then a minus and luckily we get a break there and then from negative 1 to 2 okay so all I did there was I, I just integrated that and now we're going to um, put all this into our calculator and well that's about it so let's go and put this into the calculator and I, I really hate the dead time. Um, let's let's actually just snip it. Okay, so uh, we we integrated our our function, and then when we plug in, you know, two, and then subtract uh, the you know capital F of negative one, we end up with sure enough a negative area, and of course you know that's pretty easily. Uh, predicted because, well, like we said, the 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 pink shaded area is is uh, just visually it, there's more of it than the gray shaded area. Okay, now we get to see where these uh, um, what am I trying to say? Where these integrals really shine. When we, when we talk about profit, because again, like I said, many of you taking this course are going into business, and you'll be using this. And if you don't, I mean, a, a program will or something. I don't know. Okay, so. There we go. Alrighty. So Northeast Airlines determines that the marginal profit in hundreds of dollars per seat from the sale of X seats on a jet traveling from Atlanta to Kansas City is given by our function here. And it is uh, capital P uh, capital P prime of X is equal to the apps. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the square root of X minus six. And we want to find the total profit when 60 seats are sold. OK. So um, looking at this particular function, right, just look at it real quick it appears that um, up until about 35 seats we are operating at a 100% loss so uh, for for this for this plane um, for this plane to begin not not make profit but begin to make profit we need to sell more than 35 seats okay but if you recall keep in mind uh, from the previous example we said let's go back we said that there is more negative area, again, the uh, the area underneath the x-axis, there is more negative area than positive area. Okay, And this is a pretty interesting example here because if we look here, well, notice how all the negative area is right um, from, you know, from 0 to about 35. And then, like I said, we begin to make profit here in this gray area. But if we look at this, we're wanting to find the total profit when 60 seats are sold. Um, and of course, we have the the pink negative area and the gray positive area. What it looks like, there's still more shaded pink area than there is gray area. So looking at this without without even uh, you know integrating, it looks like we're not even making a profit at all because well there's there's more negative area than positive area. So it looks like honestly, it looks like maybe about 75 or 80 seats is when we're going to start to make profit to cancel out 
the um, uh, it's not negative profit, is it? I don't know. To to cancel out the 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 yeah negative profit. We'll just say that it's early. So let's begin this. Uh, in order to set this up, well, we're just going to do the integral from zero to sixty. My function is, we're just going to go and write this as x to the one half, okay, because we know the square root of x is x to the one half, and then minus 6. And then if we integrate this, well, x to the one half, I go up 1. I'm sorry, dx. I almost did that mistake. Um, so we go up 1, so we get x to the 3 halves. We divide by 3 halves, so we end up with um, 2x to the 3 halves over 3. Uh, minus 6x, and then again, this is from 0 to 60. And so if we integrate this, uh, we can do this one uh, behind the same, so 2 times 60 raised to the 3 halves, and all that divided by 3, minus Okay, so we end up with a, sure enough, we have a negative uh, 50.16. Okay, now again, whenever we have the zero here, it's pretty easy, right? Because, I mean, if we plug in a zero, that goes away, that goes away. So really, I only had to integrate or um, evaluate at 60. So sure enough, um, we don't even have a profit when we sell 60 seats. We, we, we're operating at a negative profit, uh, precisely. Um, negative 50.16 uh, and okay it's it's in hundreds of dollars so um, multiply that so we're looking at a profit of negative uh, five thousand sixteen dollars so negative five thousand sixteen dollars hmm. that's awful sorry about that okay so uh, what does this what does this mean? Again, like I said, when we when we originally looked at this, I said, well, hey, you know, we have, we have the area under this curve here is is more than the area under this curve, and so we, you know, of course I, I knew the answer, but uh, looking at the the graph of it, we we could say, well, we're going to have a a negative profit here, and sure enough, we do whenever we integrate from zero to sixty. All right, and lastly, <clears throat> snip this and give it its own page real quickly. So I've said before uh, in, in a lecture, we talked about position function, velocity function, and acceleration. So, well, I want to say this, I'll just put it front and center, because it, 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 it's saying the same thing that, that we talked about earlier. Uh, if we take the... the uh, we have some possession, some some position function s of t. Okay, if we take the derivative of s of t, the first derivative is the velocity. The second derivative of s of t, or the first derivative of velocity, is acceleration. So yeah, let's actually do that like this. Um, s of t, no, actually I, I think that'd be confusing. We'll just keep it. We'll just keep it like this. Okay, so. If we talk about taking the first first derivative of my position function, we get velocity. The second derivative of my position function is acceleration. Well, then we can obviously work backwards as well, right? If we have uh, acceleration and we take the derivative of the, I'm um, not derivative, we take we integrate the acceleration function, we get velocity. And then if we integrate the velocity function, we get the position function. And so we're gonna uh, do that here in this example. Next example here, rather, sorry. Oh, did I miss it? Oh, yeah, here it is. All right, one moment.
Okay, sorry about that. All right, so uh, this particular problem, Juanita is driving her car at 40 miles per hour when she applies the brakes. Uh, and the car comes to a stop after seven seconds. So her acceleration during the time she slows to a stop is given by our function a of t is equal to negative 2.394t, where zero, uh, t is between 0 and 7. Again, the, the whole thing where in your previous courses we uh, just hammered home the idea of, of domain, this, this, this is why. So uh, a, we want to find Juanita's velocity function v of t over 0 to 7. So as we said over here, the the first uh, if we if we integrate the acceleration function, we get to velocity, and then of course if we uh, integrate the velocity function, we get to the position function. Well, we are given the acceleration. So in order to find the velocity, all we have to do is integrate our acceleration function. So uh, by integrating the acceleration function, that's just going to be. Uh, from, well, we don't have to do that, actually. Uh, well, yeah, never mind. We do want to integrate this, and we're integrating negative 2.394t, 2.394t, uh, dt. Uh, integrating that, uh, this t goes up 2, so we've got a negative 2394 t squared all over 2 plus c. Okay. Now, what we did here was we did an indefinite integral. All right, and this is uh, this is what we did when we first did integrals. An indefinite integral, if you recall, you know, we, we don't we don't have any sort of numbers here, and then we we have a plus c. Right. We don't know what that plus c is yet, but we are given the information needed to solve what c is. So. Uh, what is that information? Well, we are told we are told that uh, one eight is driving her car. Um, where are we at? Okay, so uh, our position function here is just going to be v of t is equal to not position function, sorry, our velocity function is equal to a negative 2.394 t squared. Um, you know, actually, let's just move this to the right and put the v of t there. Okay. All right, so. Um, we're told that she is driving her car at 40 miles per hour or 58.67 feet per second. And we want to find her velocity function. So we're going to do this in feet per second. So at time equals uh, t equals zero, we have 58.67 uh, feet per second. And then uh, we're going to, we put in zero over here for t. And I said this was like a circle. But we're going to put zero for t because that's at the uh, initial time. So at the initial time, uh, we are um, driving at 58.67 feet per second. And of course, if uh, you know zero squared is zero, negative 2.394 times zero is zero, zero divided by two is zero. So we end up with just figuring out what c is there. And again, that's just doing the initial time with with, with our with our speed here. Okay, so my velocity function is now set my velocity function is v of t is equal to negative 2.394 t squared all over 2 and then plus c which is just going to be my uh, 58.67 58.6 dum dum point six seven. Yeah, whatever. All right, so this is my velocity function, and uh, in order to get to the the next part, let's go ahead and we're gonna have to snip this. We're working on B here. All right, so what what does B want us to do? It wants us to 
uh, how far did the car travel while Juanita was braking? Okay, so this is where we see that time is from zero seconds to seven seconds. So we're going to have we're, we're going to integrate our uh, our velocity function here. We're going to integrate this this function um, from zero to seven. So let's go ahead and get rid of this two in the in my denominator here. What I mean by that is I'm just going to do the we're just going to do negative 2.394 divided by 2. So negative 2.394 divided by 2 is. Let's rewrite this. So we're going to have v of t is equal to a negative 1.197 t squared. 58.67. All right, so the reason why I did this is because I'm going to have to integrate this function, and I, I'm, I'm like you, I don't like fractions. I don't want to do a fraction if I don't have to. And so uh, that's why I wanted to get, go ahead and get rid of that 2 down there. So I divided I divide this by 2, and I end up with a, a you know, to me, a, a nice prettier function here. So we're going to we need to integrate this function from 0 to 7. 0 to 7. And then dt, and let's dip this puts on the next page. Let's snip it a little bit better. All right, so luckily this isn't too bad uh, to integrate here. We are just going to have a, uh, a negative 1.197t cubed divided by 3 plus 58.67 t. Right, and we are integrating from 0 to 7. Okay. All right, so from here, instead of putting this on to, into the calculator, I'm just going to go ahead and snip what the textbook has right here. Alrighty, so when we plug in uh, when we plug in seven into our function uh, and and zero into and subtract you know well zero because again pretty easy whenever zero is is uh, part of the part of one of the numbers where we have to sub in because again zero cancels out these two so anyways we plug in seven we end up with two hundred seventy three point eight three so what does that mean all right so that means that the that this car it, it traveled 273 feet before it actually stopped and of course we can see that if we if we uh, look at our velocity function this is what our velocity function looks like if we graphed it and of course we can see that uh, we do indeed um, travel 273.83 feet so those last two examples really kind of show uh, what what the area under curve means uh, I think I think the I think the airline example is a little more interesting because we, we see that uh, you know, you can't always operate at a at a profit, and you need a certain amount of you know tickets sold to actually get to that profit. Uh, but anyways, that concludes today's lecture. Shoot, I did that again.